Hey everyone, just before we get started, I want to quickly apologize. Something funky happened with Michael's audio. Not exactly sure I've made it a lot better, but the interview was so good, I just can't not release this one. So I apologize. It'll be fixed in the next one, promise. So with that, enjoy the episode. Getting young people to play pretend isn't the hardest thing to do. Getting those kids' parents to play is a whole different story. This week on Schedule for Launch, join me, Zach Walsh, as I talk with Michael Lowe, one of the two lead designers for Stories RPG. This game is designed to teach kids writing skills with their non-gaming parents. We talk about teaching, camps, and learning through play. Welcome to Schedule for Launch, a podcast to discover projects that you may have missed. This week, I am very happy to be joined by another wonderful content creator here. Michael, thank you so much for coming onto the show this week. Dude, thank you. I'm excited. I am super excited about this. We're going to be talking about uh, Stories RPG, which is a very interesting project that I think a lot of you are going to like, especially those of you with kids because this might be a very good jumping on point for your friends who won't join you at the table. <laughs> what, a, what a terrible, I mean, it's just, you don't, you feel so, so much regret. <laughs> I always feel like, no, no, really, if you just have one day, just give me one game, you'll be in. <laughs> so Michael, before we get too much into stories RPG, can you please tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, so I've been uh, teaching for, gosh, over two, two decades now. Um, I'm a high school English teacher and, uh, you know, been playing tons of games with kids after school in the classroom. But since I was at the high school level, you know, a lot of the stuff I was doing and a lot of the development I was doing was for older kids. Um, yeah. Been gaming for longer and been designing games for gosh, since I understood you could do that, which is probably like 12 or 13. I think I remember making one of my friends who's an artist, Sean Dove. I'll give him a shout out. He's at andthankyouforflying.com. He's amazing. He's done work with like G.I. Joe. He's like a big deal. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, no, he's a really cool guy and his art's brilliant. And I have a fantasy that someday I'll be able to afford his art because he's, you know, <laughs> he's an expensive dude. Um, but he reminded me that... Uh, that we used to play a game I made when I was, I guess I must have been 13 or 14, called Lego Battles, where you would build little <laughs> Mad Max Lego contraptions, and we would use the tile on my sunroom floor, and you would blow parts off of the other guy's vehicles and scavenge them for fuel. And he was like, oh. you, you made that when you were like 13, 14? He's like, I was, he, he said something, we used to play that, and I was like, yeah, I made that. He's like, I thought that was a legit game. And I was like, well... I mean, it was, but <laughs> so yeah, I guess I've been building games and educating for a very long time. I'm also a parent of an eight-year-old who is a story fiend and of course also a Lego fiend. That's great to hear too. I mean, kids are an excuse for you to collect Legos again. It's, uh, it's really just, you know, <laughs> it's just an open door for me to satisfy my own, uh, my own dark desires, but uh, we dig it together, which is great. Exactly. It's a lot of fun and it's time to bond. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, playing games is, I mean, it's really the origin of learning. And that's the thing yeah. that I think is so cool about story games is you don't have to tell a kid how to play make-believe. Kids do that without anybody giving them any instructions. And I always, I, I guess part of learning to be a parent for me was sort of watching him and relearning gaming through him. Because I was like, okay, he knows how to do it. We're the ones who don't know how to do it. We have to create rules and <laughs> systems and ways to do it in order to get ourselves back into it. What can I learn from watching him and his friends just spiel? And uh, yeah, I don't know. I feel like I'm learning new stuff all the time. That's great to hear, actually. I love that. So can you tell the audience a little bit about what Stories RPG is? Sure. So um, in addition to being a high school teacher for the last two years, I've been running a summer camp, which has now turned into a full year camp called Luck of Legends. You can find it at luckoflegends.com. 
And uh, it began as an extension of a game I was running for some neighborhood kids. Uh, it was Sage and his friends and uh, involved a lot of Legos. And I was designing games <laughs> for them. And come the pandemic, we moved online. And very quickly, oh. I found that the online tools that were available weren't really allowing us to have the kind of experience that we wanted. Things were much more map focused and combat focused and much less story focused and personality focused and relationship focused. And so I started to design for kids. And Luck of Legends uh, became a testing ground for different teaching mechanisms for teaching writing and storytelling and collaboration and social skills in online role-playing games. And so by the end of uh, the last two years, I have five settings and a role-playing game that I've refined quite a bit. And I ran into uh, the creator for Stories Podcast, Daniel Hines, uh, who was submitting a one-page yes, RPG. Podcast. Unbelievable. Um, yeah, I can say a little bit about my experience uh, with him, if you're curious. But yeah, I ran into him at a one-page RPG jam, and he said, yeah, I'm making an RPG for kids. And I didn't know it was Daniel Hines. I was like, oh, I'm, you know, that's my thing. Uh, here, what do you got? And I looked at it, and I tore it to pieces and was like, yeah, there's a bunch of things that aren't really working here. Design-wise, I don't know if you've played this out with kids, but you might find that. And he said, oh, that's that's great. I'll really use that. And I was, I was like, what do you do for a living? He's like, oh, I have this podcast. And I was floored. Um, and that's how we kind of got to know each other and started working together. That's so cool. And like, not how I expected you to have, to have met actually, <laughs> which is fun. Let's actually touch up on that a little bit more. So for those of you who don't know, Stories Podcast is probably the largest kids podcast out there. It actually, you know what, Michael, do you want to talk a little bit about this? Because you, you and your, your, your kids use this one, don't you? So, yeah. Um, so, so my son, Sage, he's, uh, he's eight now, but when he was younger, uh, he had a respiratory problem, especially when he was very okay. little. And Stories podcast came out about seven years ago, and it was yeah. really out there before anybody had gotten into podcasting for kids. It was sort of the mm -hmm. first podcast for kids. And one of the things that my wife and I really loved about it was the fact that it was, it was all about storytelling and it was old school fairy tale storytelling, but updated and very multicultural, very diverse, very inclusive and, um, and very thoughtful. And uh, the voice of stories podcast, Amanda Weldon, she's, she's, I found out later, she's a, she's Fantastic. a trained child psychologist, which makes complete really? sense. Yeah. So she does music therapy and, and that's one of the reasons she's, brilliant vocalist, musician. And she and Daniel Hines started producing this because Daniel Hines couldn't find an appropriate podcast for his daughter, uh, Gracie. And so in we listened to hours of this when Sage was little and sick, and it really provided just a, a really wonderful, engaging respite for him and for us. We could listen to it together and chat about it, I can sing you songs from the podcast. I could sing Dog King off the top of my head at the drop of a dog hat. Dog King's great. It's the best. Um, we're, we're talking about a Dog King game, although we're like we're kind of like, okay, how do you communicate the comedy there well enough yeah. to do Dog King right, you know? But anyway, so yeah, I mean, he was, it was funny because, you know, when he told me he was Daniel Hines after we'd been chatting and I'd been giving him feedback, and he was like, oh, thanks, this is great. <laughs> Uh, I was like, oh, my God, you know, we I've listened to your stories for years. And he was like, you know, that's great to hear. And one of the interesting things as we've gotten to know each other is he's like, yeah, you know, podcasting can be oddly isolating. He's like, you know, yeah. hearing stories like yours is, is really important to me because me, I'm just, you know, creating content in my work from home studio. And I don't always get to hear from people who my stories have had an impact on. And so... That's one of the reasons he was also interested in moving into gaming. Mm -hmm. I can relate to that a lot. Um, mm. it, it's it's one of those things where up until very recently, mm. scheduled for launch, like I, I think I told you right before when we were talking a little bit before, scheduled for launch is like suddenly blown up quite a bit in like a very nice way, which right I think on. is great because this is all about promoting indie developers 
Yeah. Mainly because I was a little tired of 5e and only hearing about 5e. I'm not going to say anything. Nothing against 5e. I'm not going to say Nothing anything bad. 5e. You won't catch me on, on yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Nothing against 5e. <laughs> I was just tired. Play your thing. <laughs> Play your thing. Exactly. Yep. So I can relate to the isolation bit. And that, yeah. I'm I'm so glad that you and Daniel are finding a way to uh, assist him in making something that he can kind of relate to the, the community a little bit more with. Well, yeah. So it was very interesting because, you know, he had a I think he had b- based his rules on Rysis, if you know that indie game. Um, very they loose dice mechanics. Familiar. It's it's cool. Yeah. Um, my mechanics are based uh, loosely on Blades in the Dark, but very loosely. Uh, only yeah. in the sense that it's a, um, you know, it's a, you either fail, you succeed but with trouble, or you succeed without trouble. Um, and it's a dice pool of d6. Uh, yeah. I like that mechanic a lot and found it really worked with kids. Because you don't have to worry about adding anything. I love mechanics that involve math, but this was a very simple, like, find the high die. And I also was looking for, uh, to create a game which was primarily narrative. So one of the things that was very important to me was to uh, not to lose, like I I was telling you, you know, what my son taught me. Kids can tell stories, (laughs) right? If you ask a kid, you, you tell a kid, here's the world, right? And you give them a good setup and you say, who are you? They can tell you. And they'll give you all sorts of details about who they are. And I wanted to turn that into something that could help them resolve actions and create drama. Because to me, a good dice mechanic is about, one, resolution, but also, two, creating uh, that, you know, if you've ever read the uh, article on the eight kinds of uh, win in games, there's a great scholarly article about it. Yeah, so, you know, that, that sense of joy or wonder or surprise that's a that's a crucial element to fun storytelling in a collaborative mode. That's one of the things that's fun about the table. When you roll and, you know, there's that shriek or that gasp because, yeah. you know, you got double sixes or you got double ones or whatever the outcome is, right? <laughs> um, so, yeah, working on it, you know, his needs and mine and his interests and mine were very aligned. Um, I've been developing uh, in my camp a way to use that incredible emotional investment and feeling of connection that you have at the table to inspire longer writing projects. So right now, one of my students is bugging me to edit his novel. It's 40 chapters now, and it's based on one of my oh, worlds. Boy. And yeah, he's 11, and um, and now he's writing, you know, he's got 80 pages of material that he needs me to go through with a but it's the it's the communal joy and celebration of reading the stories aloud to each other and then weaving them back into the plot. When somebody's yeah. character or hook that they created in their fiction, and that's how we spend our first hour in the camp. We read aloud and we celebrate and everybody gets story points to build their character based mm-hmm. on the story that they've told. And so okay. and then once we get the celebration out, then the secondary celebration is when their their material shows up in the game and that's the Uh, that's the sort of like the reaffirmation of yeah it's real and we're in it and that's my joy i mean this year i've been out of the classroom which has been a huge shift because that's really central to how i think about the world like i i I jones on getting to teach kids it's amazing they teach you so much they keep you alive you know and uh being able to be in the game with kids and watch that moment where we weave it together and everybody sees it and watching them pick up on each other's themes. That's been dope. This, uh, one of my current classes, one kid created a plant, witch in his backstory who caused trouble for his animated bone dragon. And another kid picked up on, decided his character had plant magic and wrote that into his backstory. A third kid took both of theirs and wove them into his story and said, yeah, I was created by the plant witch who's actually the other character with plant magic's mother. And we're actually oh. long lost brothers and we didn't know. And the other kids, you know, we always ask for agreement. And the other kids were like, yeah. And it was like watching them do the work of creating this larger plot. So stuff like that for me is hugely rewarding. And it makes me feel like I sort of, 
don't know why it took me so many years to get to figuring out how to make role-playing educational. Because as an educator, emotional engagement and a feeling of community ownership and collaborative energy, I mean, that's what keeps you coming back to the table. Um, and it's so huge. Nothing can give you quite the same experience as a good story game. And I feel like, I, I don't know, I, I think it's sort of fortuitous that I ran into Dan because I was like, man, this is powerful. And Daniel was like, yeah, can we do this? And I was like, yeah, let's go. That's so much fun. Uh, I love that so much. It's, I'm <laughs> glad that it's working out well. I'm super One of the excited. Biggest, <laughs> you should be. I am. Uh, <laughs> One of the biggest things about Stories RPGs, it's actually advertised specifically for non-gaming parents and their children. So obviously we understand the whole bringing kids into the fold. Mm. Why specifically non-gaming parents? Well, um, I love gaming parents, but they don't need my help. <laughs> They're already figuring out ways to play everything that they love at the table with their kids, and that's awesome. I mean, I think every gamer in, in their heart of hearts is just ready to tell stories at the drop of a hat, and they don't need anybody coaching <laughs> them. As I said, I think you know, story gaming is incredibly powerful as an educational tool and also as a form of therapy and also uh, culture building. You know, culture is this very amorphous and hard to define thing. And what really good gamers get into is learning how to create a shared sense of values and a shared commitment to a narrative and collaborate in a meaningful way that really creates an internal culture at your table. And as a parent, holy, I mean, that's the, that's the brass ring for every parent. We all want to have that with our children in a meaningful yeah. way. And if that can be educational and creative, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think as a parent, you know, anybody would ever say, yeah, you know, an opportunity to connect with my kid and teach them and collaborate with them and create and be inspired. <laughs> yeah, I don't want that. Um, so yeah, I want to democratize that. I want to get that in parents' hands because it's an immense tool, but it's very strange to me and in the writing of this game, and I should say it's technically the the first uh, release, because we're going to do multiple books for this game, provided it catches on and we get yeah. enough attention. But the first game we're going to be doing in a world of Daniel Heinz's, uh, he wrote the Max Goodname series, which is very yes. clearly an homage to D&D. It's very old school um, feeling sort of uh, Euro fantasy. Um, we're doing Star Sworn, where uh, in this mm -hmm. world... Uh, during the first episode, there's a legend that stars are where the ma or where magic came from, when the stars fell to Earth, and but it's been a very long time since that happened. And in the first episode, it ends with the stars falling and choosing heirs to their abilities, and that's sort of the inspiration for chapter two. So we're starting there with Star Sworn, but every month we're looking to have another chapter, which is a. It's designed. Um, for non-gaming parents as a sort of combination choose-your-own-adventure coloring book RPG. Um, I've got art from a buddy of mine named Rob Hebert, who's unbelievable. You can find him at nerdypapergames.com. Um, he's done some really cool indie stuff. Um, uh, Space Bounty Blues, if you've seen it. Okay, that's it. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> I was, him. I was, like, <laughs> I was like, I know that name. I'm not sure where from. Yeah, well, he's part of my uh, he's part of a great group that I'm a part of, uh, Story Games Glendale, and that's where a lot okay. of little indie creators, um, Jesse Bernaco, uh, Christian Yetter, um, Tomer Garantz, if you know him, um, yeah, yeah, they all are there, and uh, they're all we all workshop games together, and uh, yeah, he uh, I sort of floated this by him and was like, could you do line work for like a coloring book for kids if I gave you? And he was like, yeah, let's go. So um, so he's got these unbelievable splash pages, um, like the Red Knight. I love that one. He drew us that map of the Starfall Festival. So looking for those elements that are familiar, both to parents and kids, the activity book, the coloring book, mm -hmm. and then using them to teach some of the principles of gaming. And that's the interesting thing. Like when you think about, gosh, why wouldn't more people do this? The answer is 
because there are a lot of invisible skills involved. That's yeah. one of the reasons it's so good at teaching people things. You know, there's all this stuff about how to come to agreement about what's going to happen, how to resolve issues, how to create and iterate sort of plot lines and ideas together. And um, oftentimes I think that if you look at an, a gaming book, it it operates with a lot of assumptions. It's sort of like picking up a, um, you know, I've been working on Affinity Publisher uh, to lay this out. And, um, you know, if you know anything about Photoshop, you're good with Affinity Publisher. It all, it all works the same. <laughs> if you have no idea how Photoshop works, Affinity Publisher is completely... Uh, obscure to you. You're sort of like, I don't know where to begin. And I think a lot of games play off that. They, they organize information in a way that's familiar to gamers. They yes. tell you, here are the rules, and here's what you need to know about resolution, and here's how uh, conflict works. And if you hand one of those books to a non-gamer who's not an 11-year-old who's doped out on the pictures of red dragons, they're going to look at it and go, I don't know how to process all these rules. Um, and that's the reason only people who sit down at a table ever do the thing. Because somebody else mm -hmm. says, okay, now do this. They break it down for them. So I wanted this book to take the, the role of the ambassador at the table. I wanted to do, it to be familiar enough and accessible enough that you could kind of pick it up and play around with it and figure it out as you went. So in the first chapter, I reveal some of the rules. In the second chapter, there will be more. And there's a slow scaffolded release so that over time, kids and parents, as they develop mastery and feel more and more comfortable doing the thing, will be able to get deeper and deeper in. It really is a very cool system. You've sent me an early copy of chapter one. And first of all, it looks absolutely stunning. It's Yay. beautiful. I love hearing that. So, yeah, it looks great. There's uh, a lot of really simple setup for younger kids to be able to hop into this thing and get started and for for the game master section the uh, i believe it's the storyteller mm -hmm. in it's like a page long and it's great it's like this is what you do you're responsible for conveying the story and helping your kid make decisions but what i really like about it is the last i think it's like page 36 37 mm -hmm. there is two blank sheets for the challenges mm -hmm. and so one of the best things about stories rpg is the fact that it has the it has different challenges laid out or events laid out as little splash pages that you can really easily hop in and just go and do that so i'm guessing that this was designed with the fact that either the parent or the kid will eventually want to design their own Yes, and I think the goal here, like I said, is scaffolding towards mastery. I almost didn't include the Build Your Own Challenge pages in the first chapter, which is the free for download, uh, you know, get started. And you'll notice I didn't even put anything in about here's what this is. Um, yeah, and part of the reason there. I, yeah, part of the reason I'm, I'm sort of playing with the idea whether I'm going to do that or not. I think we often over explain things in gaming. Mm -hmm. I think we do this thing where we, we say, well, if you don't say exactly what it is, people won't know what to do. And I think that actually, if you say exactly what it is, people won't read what you said. If they're not gamers. Yeah. If they're gamers, they're like, no, 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 no. Explain all the workings. It's like buying a car. If I buy a car, I want you to tell me, like, it gets good mileage, it's safe, and it, you know, I, I want, there are a few features I need to know, and that's what I need to know. If you tell me everything about the mechanical specs, unless I'm a car head, I'm going to glaze over real fast. And I think it's very similar to <laughs> yeah. that. And so I was like, yeah, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to lay in, and each of the challenges is two pages, right? A read aloud yeah. intro to get kids into the scene with a really cool, colorable graphic to get them visually picturing it. And then a series of, you know, I had to think it out. What is the most important thing for a parent to know? if they want to run a non-scripted, and I wanted to be careful not to overwrite the scenes, a non-scripted episode scene for kids. And I have three, three little bits. The first one is explore the scene. And it gives you, here are things you can ask and details you can play with when you're just telling the story. The second is make a move. 
And that's, that's where the dice come in. These are some things you might try doing with your abilities on your sheet that could help this problem. And the third uh, little, little banner is troubles and triumphs. Here are good things and bad things that might happen in the scene as a result of your role. And each of these sections is very clear. You know, you're free to do this however you like. This is here to help you. For me, that was really a process of cutting down. And uh, it's funny because I'm lucky to have my wife and our neighbor, who's a very good friend, uh, Emily. She's actually the script writer for Ratatouille. So uh, the script writer for Ratatouille is oh, my editor. Oh, my goodness. I, I know. <laughs> like, this is, this, <laughs> It's one of those like weird like LA things where we like moved in and we're like, "Hi, how are you?" And of course the pandemic means that now our kids are besties and we're hanging out yeah. every day at the fence cuz we had nowhere to go. Mm-hmm. But um but yeah, so she they were both non-gamers and they were my readers. Okay. And the rule was if they at any point felt like putting it down, I had to cut. And so, you know, my wife would take a look and she'd be like, "Too long." And she'd throw it down. I'd like, "Okay." And I'd go back and I'd cut it down. And so it was this really productive and fun process of seeing things, taking off my gamer goggles, I guess, and seeing yeah. things as a parent only again. And that's so interesting because I personally can't relate to that yet, but I can see where the appeal is. And like, that's, it's a very delicate balance mm-hmm. because I remember the first time I was handed, and I'm going to use Dungeons and Dragons again. Of course. I was handed the player's handbook. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I need to know all this. And my friend was like, No, you need to know <laughs> one. You need to know two pages. Yep. And I was like, Oh, okay. <laughs> yup. <laughs> well, yeah, no, of course. Like, how can you not? It feels like a textbook, right? I mean, that's the funniest it thing. It is a most... textbook. <laughs> well, that's the thing is game game texts are textbooks, and they're textbooks yep. that that you know kids only make their way through for the pictures. That's what's so amazing. I've been having this conversation. I actually just had this today. Uh, Jesse Bernaco, he's another indie developer, and he's one of my favorite guys to bounce ideas off of. But he and I were talking about art and the role of art in games. And he was saying, art must tell you exactly what happens in the game, or it's a lie. And I was like, wow, that's deep. And he was like, no, look. Here's, you know, look at the original Dungeons and Dragons. He's like, see the dragon, see the pile of treasure, see all the grimy dudes with weapons. That's what the game does. And I was like, yeah, that's fair. And he was like, and here are some, <laughs> here's some illustrations from like other games where there's a promise made that isn't followed through on. Mm-hmm. And I was like, wow, that's deep. And uh, he used another example of a great one, which was a illustration from Troll Babe, if you know the, the indie uh, game. It's about. I do not. It's a race of non. They're actually non-gendered. Um, okay. Other creatures, and it's a it's a spoof on, and it's a it's an investigation of a lot of classic racist fantasy tropes. Okay. Um, and you play as uh, these others who have to deal with other people's perception of you. But he used oh. a particular mechanic, which, as an example person grieving a fallen friend and there's a rule in the game that however healthy you are the people you are connected with are one stage less healthy so if you're one away from incapacitated they're dying it's a way to mechanize a type of emotional engagement with caring for others right you're not you're not fighting for your own life you're fighting for everyone else's Um, i'm always interested in mechanics like that but anyway, and I, I was like, I was a little nervous and I was like, okay, will you look at the art in my game? And I threw it at him. He's like, yeah, no, this is really connected. Every single one of these scenes, you get what, you, what you're promised. And I was like, yes, because that's, that's key for me. We had an episode a little while ago where myself and the designer basically talked about art for the entire time for that exact reason. Mm-hmm. It's a very good episode too, but I'm not going to talk about it. No, no, yeah. no, hey, I'm going to go listen to it because I'm into it. Um, yeah, I think um, I think one of the interesting things for me. So I'm someone who teaches writing, and um, early on in my camp development, one of the coolest things I was able to do with my camp, which is totally illegal if you're trying to produce your own material, I made my game on slide decks, 
And because it's not for public consumption, I'm not selling the game. I am yeah. a tutor and a and I run games and that's the service I sell. So every one of my original games I developed into this very polished, shiny, um, really well illustrated uh, deck, and kids just go nuts. I would, you know, grab some game maps and they would start labeling where these locations were and writing stories about the locations so we could travel there, and it really emphasized to me that one of the things that's so brilliant about really great game design and really great game experiences is they they teach you how to tell stories by activating the story architecture that you already have. Kids yeah. have frameworks for so much storytelling. They have so many media building blocks now more than ever. And if you can access those and then teach them that, yeah, don't worry, you don't have to play in the world of, you can take that world apart. You want to play, you, know, you take it apart. Find out all the blocks you like. Find the blocks from some other world that you like too. Put them together. Do a mashup. Let's go. Um, and kids love that. Um, one of my favorite games is, uh, I'd say it's uh, it's Pokemon meets uh, Conservation. You, it's I, current working name in in Luck of Legends is Beast Preservation Core. Uh, and okay. it's a riff off. If you know Sandy Pug's game uh, games, they just re they're currently kickstarting and they're still in production for a game called Monster Care Squad. And yep. I thought it was the coolest idea. And I was like, sweet, I'm going to riff on that. And so we built this game where you are researchers at a magical institute and you are interested in the conservation of magical creatures who are beginning to die out because people are overusing magic and as a result, draining it from the world. And, and the goal is, how do you figure out how to get people and beasts to be in balance rather than in conflict. And if you can't, how do you help reestablish that beast population somewhere where they're safer? And it's cool because it gives me all these opportunities to do nonviolent conflict resolution and really creative problem solving. And you know, you get kids like, well, can we research the soil? Because maybe there's something in the, you know, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, you can research the soil, go. Um, but it's cool because it's a very different framework than the classic yeah. high fantasy thing. And it also, you know, they all get to run around with their favorite beast as a companion. So, you know, you've got the kid with the flying cat and you've got the other one with the giant terrifying worm that burrows underground and is covered in slime and looks kind of like something from aliens. Anything yeah. they want, right? And I mean, which gamer hasn't played that one game where everybody has five pets? Dude, it every kid... There are things I have learned about gaming with kids. One is every kid wants a pet. Two is nobody wants to be a human because they're boring and lame. Yeah. And uh, and the third, <laughs> yeah. There's there's a couple rules. If there are if there is tech, everybody wants to either be a robot or have a robot bestie. Um, so very very <laughs> crucial things that I've learned to build into my games. If I don't build them in, they'll make them happen. So. Oh well, that's part of the goal, isn't it? So. Oh yeah, hundred percent. Yes, and, and yes, but are my favorite things. Mm -hmm. So when you or we'll say the parent mm. is sitting down with their kid for the first time with stories RPG, mm -hmm. what does this look like? What, what are the parent, what's, what's the players, what are they looking at? So Star Sworn, Stories RPG is really just the core engine for that's going to run all of these adventures star sworn is going to be the first big release so if they sit down with star sworn uh it looks like a print and play choose your own adventure book um there if they flip through they'll see some awesome illustrations that look like they're begging to be colored it's large type it's easy to read an older kid can easily pick this up and start reading it and run it for a younger kid the key is it's addressing uh, directly the person reading and saying, here's some of the things you need to do. But it's also encouraging at every turn collaboration. So it, there are read-alouds, which get you into the scene. Um, these are inspirational. They're, they're co-written by Daniel Hines, so they've got a lot of his, uh, his funky tendencies. I leaned into the alliteration because he, he alliterates almost offensively it's it's great <laughs> and um and so i used that i totally camped it up i was like i'm gonna alliterate uh you know shamelessly Everything. and he was like do it <laughs> so we we uh we enjoyed ourselves a little much on that 
Um, so it's a little bit like reading a book to your kid, a very easy to read book, but it's also like doing an activity with your kid. It's also coloring with your kid. It's also telling goofy, weird, funny, fun stories with your kid. And every once in a while, rolling some dice to up the, uh, up the energy and up the ante. Yeah, there's a bunch of stuff. And it's like I could read what one I of like... the scenario intros if you wanted. <laughs> like that might be the most descriptive. Let's do it. Yeah, actually, I'd love that if you could just pull one up and sure. one that you like and just give people a little taste there. But I love them all. It's like asking <laughs> you to pick pick between your children. You know what? I'm going to let you pick. Do you want to hear about the Spicy Wing Showdown? Do you want to face the Red Knight? Would you like to hear about Petting Zoo Pandemonium? Or would you be more interested in the Broken Dragon? Oh, oh, or would you like to get gamed? You could also be gamed, to be fair. I am definitely into the idea of the Spicy Wing Showdown, because I think that is hysterical. Thank you. I love that scene. That that's, uh, yeah. Those that was one of my favorites. I'm a, I love a good uh, cooking show. So all of these uh, scenes are accessible from a central map. Um, you can sort of pick where you want to go, and then based on where you go, you're going to face a different scenario when you get there. So one place on the map is, of course, the uh, the food court because any good fair has a food court, and that's that's a thing. Um, so if you flip to page 20, you'll see Spicy Wing Showdown. After scoring some tasty treats near the food court, you're drawn to a crowd around two stalls. You spot Chef Susie, the best chef in town. She recognizes one of you and waves you over. You gotta help! My team sampled raw basilisk peppers and now they're breathing fire in the bathroom! And in the background, you see Chef Susie, who I originally imagined as Susie and the Banshees, like punk rock. <laughs> and Rob came back with this amazing, ancient, pigtailed, ferocious-looking chef. And behind her, you can see her knocked, senseless sous chefs. That was the other joke about Susie, Chef Susie. Oh, with that's the good. I know, she, you're Chef, chef Susie, sous chefs. Um, if you turn the page, you get challenge. Help Chef Susie win the cook-off or Chef Slicer gets a restaurant. And then it gives you the three, right? Explore the scene. Ask and answer questions, speak as your characters, describe what happens, and decide how things turn out. And then there are a few recommendations bullet pointed. Tell her, speak as the two chefs, freak out, holler directions and demands, look for ingredients, threaten, and cook. Another tag, what's Chef Slicer like? Why does he want Susie's restaurant? A third, who's in the crowd? Who are they cheering for or against? And then each time, a little nod to PBTA here, there's a list of possible moves you could make. And, uh, you know, we have five of them. There's get physical, figure it out, influence, help, or cast a spell. Usually I don't list up, it depends on the situation whether I'm going to list up magic. Because, boy, kids are not hesitant. You don't need to give them much. They'll figure <laughs> out a way to, like, they can magically solve any problem. So get physic so make a move says use lines from your story to get up to three dice or four with help. Try things like get physical, chop mince and saute with speed and power. Influence. Chef Susie is panicking. Build her trust in your in herself and your crew. You could also, of course, there's plenty of opportunities to get the crowd riled up, right? Figure it out. Find a secret ingredient, devise a genius side dish, or snoop on slicer's food. Help. Help someone, someone's dish or prep ingredients. So lots of advice on, you know, how you'd want to play this out. And then a list of triumphs and troubles. And this includes mechanical stuff like gaining a heart if you cook deliciously and eat it, or losing one if you happen to get some basilisk pepper in the wrong, uh, the wrong place. And really sort of just guiding in very simple ways people through the mechanics of how to play out a scene and use those mechanics to make the scene more exciting, more dramatic. I think parents especially, kids don't have to worry about being creative. If you tell a kid, let's tell a story, kid goes, okay, let's go. You tell a parent, let's tell a story, sometimes they're like, I'm tired. Or they'll be like, I'm not an intuitively creative person, to which I always say, you're lying, but it's okay, you don't know it. Um, you want to give them the agency and the tools to unlock that feeling of play. Because adults, if we lose it, gosh, you got to fight to get it back. 
because it's so it's important. It's hard to get back. Yeah. So yeah, that's just a little sample of uh, of the encounter at Chef Susie's stall. Um, and yeah, it ends with a, a very dramatic cliffhanger and future future episodes get pretty dramatic. I can promise things like a frog witch, uh, an underwater uh, high, well-appointed, very luxurious castle room escape, a um, uh, an encounter with a kappa, which is a Japanese water demon. There's there's a whole bunch of cool stuff. There's uh, some bounty hunters after a, a kid who's star sworn who you have to spring. Um, anyway, it's been super exciting and we're building the larger arc. One of the cooler things about this is there's also going to be an AP on stories podcast every month. So once a month, the Max, the cast of Max Goodname, um, Max Goodname's uh, character actor, Daniel's sister, is actually the voice of uh, the healer. And okay. uh, Wallace Q. Wallace, his friends are going to run through a game with him. So if you haven't picked up the system from playing the game, the AP kind of walks you through how to build a dice pool, um, you know, what troubles and triumphs are and how to negotiate them, how to run a scene to give another element to help encourage parents who are maybe a little nervous or, you know, stumble over some of the rules to sort of understand how this works and why it's great. And that'll be every month. So every month there'll be a new chapter and your uh, story runs kind of parallel to the AP story of Max Goodnames, what's happening with them. They're going to be star sworn themselves. And there will be some crossovers where, you know, Max Goodname and the crew will show up in a, in a chapter to either help you out or, uh, you know, cause the things are getting epic, you know? So it'll be, yeah. uh, it's super exciting. I'm, it's a very big project and I'm super stoked. And like I said, you should be just quick for parents or people who are listening to this. Uh, the term AP means actual play. It is people creating a, it, they're basically playing the game and showing how it's run and telling stories via the system. Yes, absolutely. And in this case, it also stands for annotated play because uh, they're going to be playing, but they're going to do us all the favor of editing. Because if you had to watch a <laughs> raw game that I ran, it would be awesome and you would enjoy it. But there would be times when you'd be like, okay, they're doing some other stuff. And as a watcher, I'm less excited than the people who are playing. So it's yeah. very exciting that he's going to be turning this into Real Stories podcast content and having it as a regular series. And then if we've got enough interest, we're looking at... He's got a superhero uh, series called Firefly, and I may release some chapters for the games that I've been running for my online storytelling camp, uh, which has been really, really fun for me in terms of getting kids to write. And they'll be a little more academic focused. I think I may also start with Monster High School, which I'm going to have to figure out a non <laughs> copyrighted name for, but it's, you know, it's a magical high school for monster teens, and it deals with all the drama of high school which is loads of fun that sounds very fun michael we're actually starting to run low on time here we've been going for roughly 40 minutes now so one of my favorite questions to ask on the show actually comes down to advice that you can give mm. other people looking to make their own stuff mm. what advice can you give to the people who are looking to make their own game but they don't have previous experience or haven't attempted it before uh so i tell all of my high school students um something and i often think that one of the great things about being a teacher is you have to spend a lot of time telling kids things that you need to tell yourself because you know yeah. telling them the truth means telling yourself the truth and what i tell them is sign up for everything and show up to everything you're even remotely interested in because it's much easier to say no than to, uh, than to find an opportunity without trying. Try everything. Yeah. What's the worst that can happen? Somebody says yes to you and you, you have to say, ah, oh, gosh, I'm not really that into it. Um, <laughs> so, so show up to everything. Find a community. Find people who are going to encourage you. Um, one of the great things I think about uh, some of the things we've learned uh, over the past couple years, I think all of us, is that we've been wasting opportunities to connect with people um, yeah. that we, we could have taken earlier and more often. We were isolated and there are ways to connect that, you know, they might not be something intuitive to start with, but, you know, get online, get on some discords, um, find a meetup. That's how I started yeah. on this whole journey as I showed up to a 
online meetup for Story Glen uh, Games Glendale, and that's where I met Rob. And signing up for that uh, one-page RPG jam on Itch, that's where I met Daniel. Um, all these things happened because I got into touch with people who sort of amplified my energy, and we we riffed off each other and built a bigger thing. So that's thing one. And the second thing is, just keep doing it. Have fun with it. Um, yeah. Don't don't put too much pressure on yourself to make something perfect. Make something joyous. Um, that's the brilliant thing about this hobby. I feel like everybody I meet in this is in it because it's a wonderful vehicle for learning to enjoy creativity. If you don't think of yourself as an artist, no worries. You don't think of yourself as a writer, no worries. You're not an actor, no worries. Sit down at a game table and you will find yourself creating. And you'll find a lot of those stumbling blocks, a lot of those lies you tell yourself about what you are or what you aren't fall away as you enjoy play, which is really the root of creativity, right? Yeah. And I'm going to tack on a little bit of something because mm. this is something that I needed to maintain mm. a hobby. Please, please. Not every group is suited for you. Mm. You are going to play, you might play with people that you either don't enjoy them or you don't enjoy how the game is played. Mm -hmm. There is nothing wrong with that. Nope. There's nothing wrong with how they play either. Just nope. try a different group. I know <laughs> this is so key. I, I, you know, I've had, so I said, I, I, my advice and you're, you're absolutely hundred percent right. Um, when I said uh, apply for everything, try everything. One of the things I tell my kids, so kids will do this thing. They'll be like, have you applied to any scholarships? And they'll be like, no, nah, I don't think I'd get in. And I'm like, mm, see, don't worry about that. Yeah. You, the problem you want to have is I've got invitations, but I don't want to go to every one of these parties. Um, yep. And absolutely, you know, the secondary piece is Choose the parties you want to attend. Find the people that you're having the best time with. Find the collaborators who are in the space, who are, are thinking the way you think, who are who amplify your ideas or make you learn things. Yeah, never uh, never settle. You, you don't have to. Nobody, nobody's. There's no force in your in your private life. Please curate. <laughs> <laughs> you're not obligated to anyone. And that's. So very true. <laughs> I yeah, having been a gamer for a long time, I will say one of the reasons I I spent a, a long time gaming, but not um, but not in groups with gamers, is I was in some groups that I I sort of was like, yeah, I don't really want to play with with you guys. You all are great, you know, you can do your thing, but I kind of don't want to play with you. And so I ended up being the guy who was always building games and running them for people who are not yeah. gamers. Um, and now I've found, you know, a lot of people in the space, and this has been a real renaissance for me. I think story games have become this much more inclusive, much more diverse, uh, really positive space, which I love. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not a war gamer guy, um, and that's part of what got me out of it in the first place. Um, yep. I want a game with joy and positivity. Um, if you want to get grimy and dark with your games, go for it. It's not my it's not my bag. <laughs> so I'm going to go play with some eight to 12 dark. year olds. Yeah. That's it. Hey, you know, and what a great game, but you know, if you want to get grimy, go get grimy, but it's not my thing, man. I'm going to be over here with, uh, you know, my ultimate game would be running Shira. You know, like if I could, if I could, you know, Shira the game, that's the, yeah. Or Steven yeah. universe or heck I'll take adventure time with a little bit of old school cool <laughs> to it. You know, that's my game. Gold ring. Yeah. Oh, I almost totally forgot. Um, you had wanted to give a shout out to somebody. Do you wanna? Do you wanna do that now? So my biggest um, shout out and my biggest thank you goes to one of my best friends, Mo Poplar of AshyFeet.com. He makes Shibuya Knights, which is an amazing forged in the dark uh, game for parents and kids to play. Sort of a steampunk anime heisty, awesome game of. Uh, of hijinks. Uh, it's really great. It plays like Saturday morning cartoons. Um, but he came to me with a project, uh, hold fast station. It's up on my itch page and it's going to be released in the spring as part of stone top. Uh, it's going to be print on demand and we're getting art and layout and all that exciting stuff. And Mo is the one who really got me into 
refining systems. And uh, he's been watching hours of our playtest tape and figuring out all the ways to modify what we do so it really works for the people who play it. And we're very into and committed to the idea of zero prep gaming. Get in, uh, have the game teach you how to play together and, and how to distribute the load of effort. And so I took a lot of that and applied it to Star Sworn and Stories RPG. All right. Um, so before we get going, Michael, where mm. can people find out more about you, more about Luck of Legends, and more mm. about Stories RPG? Uh well, storiesrpg.com is where you can download the one pager. Um, it's very brief. It'll be where you can download Star Sworn um, and all the upcoming chapters. Luckoflegends.com is where you can find my classes. If you've got a kid who is a reader but not a writer, or loves stories but can't, you know, is not into reading or writing, sign them up. Um, you will have to tear them away from the computer because they won't stop typing, which is. A wonderful problem to have and it's uh it's a joy for me um you can check me out on activity hero if you're curious about reviews you can read what people say but it's really great what games can do to help kids yeah. learn how wonderful stories can be and how amazingly fun writing is um i think we sometimes we sometimes forget that in the hustle of school and that's a shame yeah um, and uh, you can, of course, check out Daniel Hines and his podcast at storiespodcast.com and uh, keep coming back because there's going to be a lot more. I'm about to start a – I do six-week sessions with my classes. We go, we go deep. We build a whole world, and we populate it, and we play out epic storylines. And so I'm going to be posting new, um, new classes around about uh, second week, third week of October. Um, and then there will be uh, some vacation classes coming up too. And then every month starting in, uh, let's see, I guess first week of October, uh, there will be the first chapter and second chapter of Star Sworn up. And then every month there'll be a new AP, a new uh, played through episode of Stories Podcast and a new chapter for you to download and play. So for those of you who are listening... This is going to be going up, I believe, the second week of October. So it should actually already be out at this point. Go check oh, this out, especially if you have not young, but younger kids in your life that you would like to give them the chance to do this. It's... Six to 99, like Legos. That's the way. Yeah. That's my target audience. <laughs> Let's go. It's very well put together, and it's beautiful, and it's fun, and I might steal it to work with some students. <laughs> Yay! Please do that. Oh my God, that would make my day. Yeah, tell me if you do. I love hearing. Of you know, anybody plays your game, gosh, your heart just melts. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for the time. Thank you for the support. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to to talk with somebody awesome about something I love. That's oh. a real blessing. Well, thank you so much for coming onto the show, Michael. It's been fabulous, and I I've been really interested in this one for a while. So I'm, I'm glad we were able to sit down and have this chat. As always, audience, all of Michael's socials and all the things that he plugged, they're going to be available down in the description below. So you can just click right there. As things get updated, we'll be updating that description. So if you're listening to this in November or past that, there will be more updates in the description down below as well. Michael, thank you so much for coming into the show. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, no problem. Audience, thank you so much for listening. Michael and Stories RPG, they're scheduled to launch very soon. So you should go out there and go check them out. All right, take care of yourself. Have a good night. Bye. Thank you so much to Michael for coming on to the show this week. I actually got the chance to use Stories RPG with a student this past week, and we had a really fun time, and it was really nice, and she wants to do it again. So hopefully we can keep that up, and it's really simple, it's easy to play. I highly recommend this one. If you are interested in it, the first chapter is free, so check the description below on where to pick that up. As always, listeners, thank you so much. In the past two weeks, we have broken the 600 downloads list, so that's within our first 25 episodes, and I want to keep that steam going. This has been 
huge for me and I've had a lot of fun, but we're making a bit of a dent here. I want to keep it up and I need your support to do that. So if you can share the show and tell some people that you like it, I'd really appreciate that. Next week's episode is going to be a little bit different. I have emailed and chatted with just about everyone from our first 25 guests, and while they won't be on, we are going to be doing an episode where I'm going to give you some updates on how those people have grown, changed, or continued their development. I'll also be answering some questions from the audience, so if you want to know anything about me or the show, ask me on Twitter or send me an email. I'll try to get through everything, but who knows how long it will go. Until then, everyone, thank you so much. Have a good week. Take care of yourselves. Bye.